Dave McAllister is a technical evangelist at uh, Splunk, and Dave has also been a champion of uh, open system, op open source, and uh, since from the early days of Linux, and before even open source was a coin term. So that's nice. And uh, I would like to give you a bit of information that is not on his bio, uh, like the fact that he was a soccer player or soccer uh, coach. And I'm not sure if a soccer or football, maybe you can correct me. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it makes a lot of sense to, to relate Murphy with a uh, site reliability engineer because it's also about getting the worst possible situations and the worst time. And we also experienced this uh, during this uh, uh, event now. And uh, at least for me, it makes a lot of sense. So here we're talking about that. So beating Murphy and user observability and smart data and some other fun things. Uh, is that fair to say, Dave? That sounds pretty straightforward to me. Are we ready? Cool. Yes, if you're ready, you can start your presentation. Sure. So let me clarify. I was actually a soccer referee, football in referee. Europe, uh, for this. So my, my line is that I'm used to people disagreeing with me. Um, and and I do work for a company called Splunk uh, as a technical evangelist, and I've, I've done so many different jobs in the, the time frame. Um, but I also want to point out that this one is designed to be a little bit of fun. Um, so in keeping with our fire and our hot sauces here, I thought I would show you Dave's insanity sauce. So if we get a little off the wall here, trust me, we'll get back to, to the right space. So as was stated, first of all, Murphy's Law. Everyone knows Murphy's Law. Whatever can go wrong will go wrong. And then there's corollary one to this, which was also added to this at the worst possible time. So the Murphy's Law is actually really describe our job um, a lot. A, a great deal of our job is things going wrong quite often, middle of the night, all those different pieces. And over time, Murphy's has expanded tremendously. So there are Murphy's laws of technology, like logic is a systematic method of coming to the wrong conclusion with confidence for this, or Murphy's law for military, no battle plan ever survives contact with an enemy, which I think goes all the way back to uh, the art of war here. But in my favorite in this military category, if you really need an officer or a manager, take a nap. That works for VPs incredibly well here. And then there are expansions to this. Abbott's, if you don't like the answer, you shouldn't have asked the question. Um, Allen's axioms, when all else fails, read the directions for this. But we see them on cooking, on cars, on physics, on measurements, on vacations. There's uh, currently right now, I have a collection of 76 pages of this category of different Murphy's laws inside of here. When I look at this, I found that there were several in here that did apply to the, our observability, this new hot phrase that we're spending a lot of time working for. And we're going to start here. If you perceive there are four possible ways that something can go wrong and, and fix them, a fifth way, unprepared for, will promptly develop. And this is what drove our need for observability. So observability is that quality of software that lets us understand how our systems are behaving. It gives us an inside look into the applications, the request uh, pathways, even into the user experience that's happening here. And from way back in the dark ages around here, when this first, first coined here, it was defining the exposure of state variables in a manner to allow inference of internal behavior. And so we couldn't see the flow going through a pipe, but we could put a measurement to understand the velocity of the flow going through the pipe or the temperature going through the pipe. We've now taken that into this application and infrastructure space, the communication space. All these things come together here to let us understand really what's going on inside of the environment that we are trying to keep up and running. And observability, therefore, is really a data problem. Um, and the more we make the system observable, the faster we can fix what's happening with this. In general, you hear three classes of data. There are actually a lot of classes, but these are the three major ones. They start with metrics, our numbers. Do we have a problem? This is what drives our dashboards. This is what drives our alerting structures here. Traces, where is the problem? What is the flow going through the application space and then finally logs, what's happening? What is the application 
or the system think is happening and what are they telling us? And they basically come down to a detect, a troubleshoot, and a root cause structure here. So when we deal with observability, the more data we can get, the faster we can get to the, the underlying cause and the faster we can respond and remediate our issues for this. Real time becomes really important. We'll talk about that. Murphy's law number two here. Every solution breeds new problems. And so we ended up with new solutions. And in general, you hear about two. There are two technology paths that are sort of coming into being that's driving this observability model here. And they are microservices, containers, if you will, um, and then cloud structures. Microservices create these massively complex interactions in here and are dependent on communication aspects. Because of that nature, those interactions may not be the same for every single request pathway. And therefore, your failures don't repeat exactly. They may repeat, but they're not going to repeat exactly inside of here. When we look at multi-tenancy, debugging can be a real challenge inside of here. And monitoring doesn't help us as much as it used to, unless we change the rules of monitoring for this. Monitoring used to be really simple. At the same point in time, we have the chaotic behavior coming into place, the elastic and ephemeral behavior driven by um, orchestration, Kubernetes, and elastic behavior, spin ups and spin downs of our virtual machines and our instances inside of clouds for here. What we need to do is be able to go all the way into being able to look at the complex monitoring rather than the simple monitoring that we used to do. Look at the complex monitoring, probe, sense, and then respond. So Murphy is number three. You can never run out of things that go wrong. Um, and I, I'm sure that most of you listening are quite aware of that simple fact. There are lots of things that can go wrong inside of here. And this describes in observability terms as known knowns and unknown unknowns. And so known knowns are the things we know can exist and we watch for. This is where monitoring used to start here. Known unknowns refer to things that we know exist, but we don't have all the information. We may be aware there are malicious hackers, but we have no idea how many there are. So we know they're malicious hackers, known knowns. How many there are? Known unknowns here. Somebody may want to penetrate a target here. We don't know what they want to penetrate. And so when we do this, exactly when they're going to or what they're going to do this is an unknown unknown. Observability gives us the ability to, to watch for things that we don't know are going to happen. And we start bringing in AI and ML into this category. Murphy's law number four, nothing is easy, easy as it looks. And this goes back to our microservices structure here. In a microservices structure, we have lots of services that are doing as little well, little is not right. Me. They're doing, they are as small as necessary, but not as small as possible. And so each service should provide the full functionality without having to necessarily depend on other microservices to perform a functional work in here, but they could be separate services. And what happens is that a microservice problem that appears in one place can propagate the problem through other services. And this means that when we start getting into deployment structures, a deployment of a service, since they don't all have to be deployed at the same time, may actually cause an issue to appear in another service. This applies not only for our request, our user interface, our user engagement, but also for our um, logging structure, um, as well as for the metrics themselves. It is easy, for instance, for a, a front end piece to be changed out and suddenly generate five times the load going through the rest of the system, which will cause the rest of the system to be out of alignment with, with the now necessary demand, which then causes the slowdown on the front end. Who reports the problem and where the problem gets reported? It's probably not the front end reporting. It's doing its job. It's just, just getting, getting throttled by a slow consumer model for this but it may show up in checkout or payment services and you need to be able to backtrack one way or the other to go through the microservices needs. 
Likewise, we talked a little bit about this, but there is this complexity issue that is also now arriving at the same point in time. Um, and this goes to the elasticity, particularly in compute clouds. And actually, compute in this case, um, we can consider public, private, hybrid. I, I don't care what kind of cloud it is, but the ability to spin up and spin down our instances in relation to the work that's going on is really important. The problem is, is that because of that spin up and spin down, we may not always have the same infrastructure running at all these times here. And that becomes um, an interesting aspect when we go to look at what caused the problem. So if, it, for instance, it's a networking issue showing up, is it because there's a virtual networking problem? Um, and if we simply restart that node, for instance, a virtual node capability, the problem goes away because we may not be on that same node. There's also ephemeral behavior. And this gets us into uh, not only do we not own the physical structure, but we may not actually be, quote, owning the virtual structure. So think serverless, AWS lambdas or Azure functions uh, as an approach, where we simply hand the service over and say, run this for me and give me a result. Those things are gone almost instantly. Um, for this, for instance, an AWS Lambda uh, warm start, I think, is 30 microseconds. An AWS Lambda general execution time, at least in, the, in, in our environment, is about 1.2 seconds. And so a problem could occur that when we go to look and see what caused the problem in a running space isn't there. And in fact, we're not even sure where it was when it ran. We can record the data that's in here. And then finally, something that quite often gets not thought about in this space is drift and skew. Drift and skew bring this into uh, a structure that says, all my systems are reporting data at various times, but they are all actually aligned. And so how we manage the drift and skew functionality helps us when we correlate the data. So Murphy's law number five, things get worse under pressure. Um, if you were managing two servers, it's not a big deal um, for here. But if you're running, um, and this is actually um, a snap of one of the uh, Splunk environments for observability, 2,247 servers, all of a sudden life can get a lot more challenging. Uh, you've got a lot more moving parts. You have a lot more things that you have to watch for. And it becomes really important that we start understanding how scale matters when we go up here. Here we get into the concepts for observability of aggregation, analysis, and visualization. And the problem when we look at this is that scaling is not one dimensional. There's actually a huge number of dimensions inside of this. So for instance, we can be looking at a scale of namespace or the number of nodes, for instance, what we just saw with, with 2K inside of here. We can be looking at pods coming up and down, pod churn, how things are starting here. We can look at the number of services. Keep in mind that the services can be your uh, functional map, but those services each could also expand. And so you may have payment services running across 18 pods at some times and three pods at other times. And we also need to be able to do the scalability challenges of being able to analyze this. Is it streaming? Is it batch? Are we looking at, at query on the fly structures? And we're bringing data in at different times. And again, correlation becomes really important. Those issues bring us into this, this larger picture, which shows that our scale, our system scale, is multidimensional. What you're looking at for this scale is the infrastructure scale with a little bit of space going to the applications here. This is infrastructure scale. We also have a similar scaling problem when we look at the application itself in this environment. And so our scale drives a lot of our needs around the data coming in, but it also drives a lot of needs around what tooling we need to be able to do this aggregation analysis visualization to lead us to a response. Number six, if it's not in the computer, it doesn't exist. Um, and this is where 
it becomes an interesting problem. In observability, we are bringing in lots of data. If we're bringing in metrics, we're bringing in traces, and we're bringing in logs. That's a tremendous amount of correlated data. And so one of the ways that people tended to approach this, there are ways of reducing uh, um, you know, a, a data issue that feels like an overload, is you could either filter, which is bandpass filtering, if you will. I'm not going to pick things in the middle. I'm going to look at the two edges. I'm only going to pick things in the middle. I'm not going to see things on the edges here. Or sampling, which is a different way of approaching a similar problem. In this space, particularly on scale, sampling is not necessarily your best friend. When we are looking at the outlier conditions here, for instance, if I have a sampling structure, the top is showing the errors per request that are coming in. And as you can see, then I'm looking across where there are, are things that could be happening. And there are little dots that are showing kind of errors in a sampling approach. I'm pulling a sample, I'm saving the sample, I'm picking the data. And what happens is that its latency shows up in the one to two second range. Well, just looking at, at the traces, I can already tell you that sampling is giving me an inappropriate picture of what's going on. Using the same application space, unfortunately not quite the same data space, but the application space for a no sampling approach shows me that I have substantial number of errors because now I'm looking at every piece of data over here and that my latency is 29 to 40 seconds. Keep in mind that these two things are incredibly issue. If I'm looking at this and I think my duration is in the two second range, I don't worry about it. If I'm looking at this and thinking that my duration is showing up in 29 seconds, I bet I have an unhappy user. And so I want to be able to make sure that I can meet the needs of this while at the same point in time, I'm also being able to provide all the data so that I can figure out what caused that 29 seconds. I want to be able to dive back into here. Sampling is not your friend when it comes to looking at our large scale complex environments. So Murphy's for seven, and we talked a little bit. Availability is a function of time. And the resolution and speed of your data directly impacts the insights you gain. When we start talking about data, and I can do an entire talk on, on data at some point, um, I, it's one of my favorite subjects for here, you're really going to fall into two categories. And we talked a little bit about this in sampling, but now let's talk about accuracy and precision. And quite often we use these interchangeably, but they're not actually. So accuracy is, is that measure correct? Are we getting the data that's correct? In a sampling approach, for instance, we may not be getting data that is exactly correct. Two seconds versus 29 seconds here. Precise means is consistent with the other measurements. So you can think of this sort of um, in terms, we tend to use the uh, concept of shooting arrows at a target. If your uh, arrows are all over the place, but one of them's in the bullseye, bullseye you have an accuracy but you're not precise. If your target errors were all grouped together, but not in the bullseye, you're precise, but not accurate. Observability depends on both. And this becomes an incredibly important characteristic so that you know that you can trust your data. This becomes really, really important, but aggregation and analysis can skew this. So here's an example of, of 10 points, requests per seconds coming in here. And I've broken this into groups. 10 second average, 13.9 requests per second. The 95 percentile is 27.05. If I break that into two pieces, first five seconds and the second five seconds, my first five seconds average is 16.4. My 95 percentile is 29.2. My second five seconds is 11.4. And my 95 percentile is 19.4. If I, for instance, had set up an alarm that was running at 20 seconds, so alert me when you hit 20 seconds, my first five seconds would show me an issue, my 10 second average would show me an issue, and my second five seconds would say, oh, everything is fine. Even though in that bottom five, I crossed 30 seconds. So when you start looking at this, this data, 
you again you need to be able to make sure that your precision is also showing there aggregation can in fact impact your ability to look at the accuracy and the precision of those three things so keep this in mind when you're looking at at the structures of what you're looking at however data resolution and reporting resolution are not the same my data is coming in at blindingly fast rates. Um, you know, uh, it is possible, for instance, at, at a CPU level to see things in nanoseconds. However, we need all the data points so that we can figure out what's going on, regardless of how we report them. If we aggregate up to one second, five seconds, one minute, that's a decision that you make based on the needs of what you need to have happen inside of here. The finer your granularity, the more your potential precision. And so, if it's really important to understand the the fine grained nature err on the side of having more precision here number eight if anything cannot go wrong it will anyway and this one this one is actually one of my favorite laws of, uh, of discussion for this and this talks about how when we looked at this, we used to really care about the environment. We may care a little bit in terms of the application and what the application is doing inside of here. We are now running everything from the front end, the user interface, all the way through our response activities. And that includes synthetics, testing to establish our baselines, real user monitoring, what's happening to every single user as they go through the system, endpoint monitoring, are they on a phone? Are they in a car? Are they sitting at a desk here? The environment itself with its various capabilities us. And then finally, how do we report and respond to this aggregation, analysis, visualization, and response? Across all of that is our communication aspects. Network performance monitoring runs that entire gamut. But each of these things may have a role. You may be really focused on back end, or you may be really focused on front end, or you may be responsible for the entire environment. But we now are seeing more things come into play, more things that we have to be concerned with, and therefore we need to have the observability data show us all those things. Number nine, whatever you do, whenever you set out to do something, something else will have to be done first. And this is something we're seeing a lot in this observability space. Observability has been coined as a phrase now for a while. But we used to have observability of 1.0, and it had logs, traces, and metrics, and each three were separate. And so when we tried to glue them back together, that didn't happen. We're now moving to 2.0, where we are collecting the data from a single environment. The instrumentation now handles logs, traces, and metrics together, and we now can have correlated data being delivered directly to our, our aggregation visualization tool. Fortunately, when we look at this, this is driven by something called Open Telemetry. Open Telemetry um, is a project that was the combination of open tracing, a CNCF project, open census, an open source project out of Google. The two merged together and formed Open Telemetry. Open Telemetry is um, a, also a cloud native computing foundation project. It is the second most active project in the world, and I'm actually very proud of the fact that we are the leading contributor um, to the Open Telemetry project. It supports the backends. It supports on any data format you want to come in here. It is an open source project with um, the import and export capabilities all understood. The tracing aspect is um, stable and I believe is at 1.2 at this point in time. Metrics is stable and we'll go 1.0 very shortly now. Logs is in beta, but we're expecting to see logs arrive by the end of 2021. So a couple of other touches I wanted to do here and those are going to break off from Northeast for a quick second. Ashley Perry's statistical axiom. There are about five of these, but this one is really important. Numbers are tools. Numbers are not rules. And what that means is sometimes you want to know not only what it's telling you, but what's coming. The problem is, is that the prediction is only as good as the data precision and accuracy here. And when we start looking at this, there are certain things that we can do um, within this. We can estimate the resolution on the input time series 
We can account for the parameters of programs, time shifts, transformations inside of here. And when we start looking at this resolution, um, which is how the computation outputs data, uh, this is where we start falling into it. And then we can start looking at this once we have this historic trends. How did this happen last week? How did this happen Black Friday versus sudden change? Did something suddenly increase or decrease 5x? Those things are issues. If something is stationary, so it's a standard line that we can pretty much establish, then yeah, it's pretty easy to, to do some prediction within the range of your resolution. Keep in mind that your resolution impacts the accuracy of what you're actually seeing. And in general, you can think of that if you have a data point, its precision is roughly uh, one realm around that. So if you're at one second, you're actually seeing from about half a second to about a second and a half, depending on this. If you were doing this, expect false positives and false negatives. This is something that you need to think about when you're looking at this. Incredibly useful, historic, sudden change, trend predictions, all these things are here but expect to look at this and not always see exactly what you think you're going to see. Baker's Law, Misery no longer loves company, insists on it. When things go wrong, it's no longer just our job, the SRE job to, to resolve this. It's now the job that's gonna be the developer. This is where our DevOps practices and culture starts coming into play here. Everybody is responsible for everything running. So this becomes our incident response. How do we identify root cause? Who is responsible for this pass off? How do we do testing to make sure that things are, are resolved correctly? And in a sense, even how do we shift left to try our best to make sure this doesn't happen in the first place? Hill's commentary. There, there are four of them here, but the bottom one um, in our space, if it doesn't matter, it does not matter. The problem is, is that in our world, there is a corollary to this uh, until it does. So if it doesn't matter, you don't have to worry about it until you do. Observability, again, gives us that data to be able to go back in and say, oh, it didn't matter until it mattered, and now it matters what the heck went on. And so now we can take a look and see what's happening there. <clears throat> and finally, to close out, all's well that ends. Um, and for that, this has been a great time. I've really enjoyed uh, chatting with y'all. And let me uh, close with one other additional law. This is called Faber's Law. If there isn't a law, there will be. And so I'd love to hear from you if you have your thoughts on what Murphy's Laws and how they apply to your own environment. Or if you've got a new Murphy's Law that you want coined that works inside of your space, feel free to reach out to me and let me know what that is. Thanks, and I'll turn it back over to, to our host. Thanks, Dave. Really on time. I really like that everyone on our tech is really on time. This is really nice. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Uh, I had other questions, but you answered all of them. So the, the <laughs> presentation was really complete. I really like it. So it, it's more about data, like how to spot and avoid bias in data. Like when Ooh. we are talking about aggregation and all that. Yes. One of my, my, my favorite topics, I wrote a, um, I think a 2200 word article on what's known as observability bias. Um, a, the bias is um, interesting. It's hard to avoid because we tend to assume that the data is exactly uh, what happened. And what happens is that when you look at this, you will bias yourself by uh, seeing the data. Um, think that sampling ex exercise. Uh, we saw the data tell us that we had a two second latency. The data actually did show us that we had a 29 second latency. We would bias ourselves towards that two seconds. What this means is that when we're looking at this, we have to be willing to occasionally deep dive into our data. Um, and if you go all the way back to the original observability bias structure here, sometimes the problem isn't what the data is showing. Um, this goes all the way back to World War II, looking at planes being shot down and deciding to armor where the bullet holes were until it was pointed out that the planes that didn't come back were the ones that they needed to worry about. So again, don't throw away data. 
make use of your data the best way that you can make sense. You are the experts in your system. You actually understand your system probably better because you're responsible for the end-to-end -end running of it. Um, and so make sure that, that, that your bias is towards deep data inspection. Good, good. Thank you. Uh, we have some inputs. They're not questions. So thank you, Dave. Full of insights. Great t-shirt, by the way. <laughs> and <laughs> super talk, Dave. Really enjoy it. So a, a bit of feedback. Uh, I Thanks. would also like to, uh, to ask, like for the slides, can you share it somewhere, like maybe on Twitter or so we can have access to the slides? Yes, I will make sure. I will make sure these slides are available. Um, I, I have to admit, honestly, uh, this is the first time I've done this presentation, and so it's been a little bit interesting uh, trying to fit everything in. Because when I started writing them, by the way, I ended up with twenty-five different laws, and I started cutting <laughs> them back, and I kept going, "Oh, I can't cut that one. That one's really important." Uh, <laughs> yes, and and, and so. So um, yes, I will put these slides out. Um, I'll send them to y'all and we can send them out to the, the attendees and registrants. Perfect, perfect. Uh, another question that I have, will this become a blog or an article, something like that? Yes, this will probably end up, um, there's been a couple of requests to, to write this into a deeper article. Um, and. I, it, it, again, I started doing this, and after I hit the first two laws and was at 1,200 words, it may become a series. Um, <laughs> for that. Yeah. And I, I, I strongly encourage people if you've got if you've got things inside of here. So you know, I've gotten a couple on sampling that have come out that have been really good. Um, I am going to collect these, and I will give you credit. So send me your information and send me your new laws, and we'll make sure that you become famous. <laughs> That's perfect. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for this. And uh, I would like to say that uh, coming up next, we'll have uh, fight, flight, and or freeze with Matt Stratton. And yeah, looking out for that. Uh, thanks a lot, Dave. Cool. Thanks. Bye. Bye.